I wanted to share some exciting news with you in that we have been in the state of New Mexico uh, attempting to get the industrial hemp over the top so that we can get people uh, back to work and, and recover from our economy as it is now. Uh, as you know, and maybe have read some of the potentials for industrial hemp and its usage. And currently, the federal government does not allow for the grow growing of the industrial hemp because it's under Schedule One, under federal law. And um, unfortunately, uh, it was called into Schedule One because industrial hemp is part of the derivative or cousins <coughs> to uh, cannabis sativa, which is marijuana with high THC level. The industrial hemp, of course, uh, people know has very less, 0 0.03 THC. And Canada, our neighboring state, has been cultivating uh, industrial hemp for, for a long, long time. In addition to that, there's been some international marketing on industrial hemp uh, that's brought into the United States, uh, or being imported to the United States, for various uh, fabrications, manufacturing, processing, of those, those industrial hemp for other use and purposes. <coughs> Here in the town of Santa Fe, we do have a, a hemp store downtown that uh, sells and um, reta on a retail basis <coughs> various kind of industrial hemp materials, uh, lotions, uh, health, food, food uh, just, just, just a variety. And it's very interesting to visit that shop because you can see uh, what would be a potential for America today. And for the past uh, nine years, I've been trying to get uh, the industrial hemp legislation uh, through the process. And each and every time in our law, we have uh, under Section 8 of, of, the, of the controlled substance, uh, the industrial hemp language is in there. And so uh, my fellow colleagues, when they see what's in Section 8, they get very nervous <laughs> and, and very alarmed because that really describes uh, marijuana and <coughs> all the THC content with it. It also contains various languages within, the, within that section, uh, from bung to smoke to getting high and so forth. So you mix that with industrial hemp and, of course, your legislation would be very uh, unfruitful on, on its passage. Uh, this year, uh, we have been studying on ways and creative ways to, to try to get uh, this legislation away from Section 8 language. And we have uh, been very successful in doing that. Uh, the House uh, Agricultural and Water Resources Committee, substitute for House Bill 565, had done that. What, what, it, what it does, it, it, it identifies a unique uh, plant that's being processed and being manufactured and grown in uh, France. It's called Centica. And that's a derivative of the industrial hemp today. And Centica has no THC base. And, uh, and that's, that's a, been a historical mark for us to get this legislation through because it takes this Section 8 language out of the bill and, and solely concentrate on the benefit that Santica Hemp will, will provide here in, in New Mexico. Our neighboring state, uh, Colorado, has been also uh, the, the forerunner in trying to get this legislation uh, through and pass. And they did pass some memorials and they did try to get it studied and, and as we did here in the state of New Mexico. Uh, and what the, my bill does is it allows for industries here in New Mexico and, and tribes, pueblos, and nations to, to buy seeds from the uh, New Mexico State University Agricultural Department. And, and they, would, they would bank those seeds and any customers can grow in there and buy seeds to, to do to plant um, on their fields uh, through a, 
a code control mechanism. And, and so there's some huge opportunities, what's this pass? Huge opportunities, I think, for farmers, uh, for commercial industries, uh, for the various uh, other businesses to invest in, in the industrial Santica uh, as, as we move forward with this. And what are the benefits? Uh, the benefits is, is tremendous. It, it, it will probably bring in, on the first year, my estimation, around $800 million to New Mexico. And uh, what it does is it, you can grow this plant and it uses very west, less water and it can be grown in arid desert. And uh, this, this particular plant is really ideal for New Mexico. And, uh, and I'm looking at large farms in the southern part of our state looking at the Navajo agricultural product industry and looking at other uh, areas where there's already farming taking place, large commercial farming, and, and be able to have them grow, cut, and bale build these, this particular uh, plant and, and take it to a, a manufacturing processing plant to get it mulch and come up with various ways to that Canada is doing now, they mulch it and they, they reprocess it and they compress it into boards, compress it into uh, materials that the automobiles are, are currently using these, these byproducts uh, in the fabrications of their dashboards, of their frames, and for insulation purposes. Um, and I understand it's being used for bricks as well. The Hickory Apache Nation has has ventured into um, looking at the, the, the using this material for bricks, clothing, uh, soy milk. You replace the soy milk, uh, and there, there's just a variety of uh, things that you can do with this particular uh, plant. And why why is it so important <coughs> uh, for New Mexico? And the tribes is, is the fact that you know we'd be the first forerunner in the United States today if we invest in our time and efforts to move this uh, legislation forward and get it passed and signed into law by the governor. And I think the potential will be uh, greatly there. Uh, I do have um, my uh, partner and person there had some vested interest in, in this uh, Santica production. Uh, her name is uh, Bernice Muskrat out of Hickory uh, Apache Nation uh, here with me and I would like to have an opportunity for her to say um, something on this on this uh, bill. Bernice. Well this is a tremendous uh, bill for the state of New Mexico. Uh, it's going to be an economic uh, boom for the state of New Mexico. Uh, we're in a national energy crisis. We're involved in foreign wars and President Clinton uh, listed this as one of the national security products that the agricultural community in the United States should be uh, holding in stock. It's an answer to the alternative fuel crisis. <coughs> it's going to be an answer. It's a good plant to, to clean up the hydrocarbons um, in the environment. Um, and it's the best part about this bill is it's THC free. Um, and you know, the people who've had an objection before no longer have that objection. And um, it's very consistent with our ideas about um, green energy, sustainable economies, renewable resources. And um, it's going to have an impact in the United States, the Southwest, and I think New Mexico can take the lead in this bill. There's been some discussion that this won't be considered till the next session, but um, Native American people believe in their prayers and they pray all the time. And so we are treating this bill as having passed. We can't see, we can't see anyone thinking that this is not a good opportunity for all the people in New Mexico. And so we're gonna treat it as having passed we're going to make our business plans based on that. So um, I'm also the Chief Financial Officer for um, Native International Solutions Incorporated. 
that uh, our business is to finance uh, projects in the state of New Mexico for everyone who's interested in growing and using this plant and producing and getting, getting involved in the value added process of this plant. So um, that, that, that's my, it's my hope that the New Mexico legislators <coughs> and leaders would take an interest in this bill. I was recruited by Gloria Castillo, Jerry and Bernice Muskrat to, uh, uh, to look at some of the scientific aspects of industrial hemp. Uh, I have a PhD in <coughs> culture and I have nurseries and so uh, when I was approached to do this I started looking at it. I'd heard for decades about the value of hemp. Uh, uh, it now is the best time since the state truly could capture the lead in getting at least a year or two lead time over anyone else in the, in the nation. Currently we bring in over $200 million of hemp that is processed from outside sources, and then we're simply playing with the, the, the small retail element instead of making it a home-based crop with all the benefits that come from that. Um, part of the reason we're here uh, in the roundhouse talking about hemp and we wouldn't be here talking about onions is that uh, industrial hemp is uh, has a doppelganger, and that's uh, marijuana. There's two ways we can start to address that. The first is to use varieties that are developed out of Europe right now and take those varieties like Santhica and start to adapt them maintaining zero or essentially zero THC while we adapt those varieties to the to the climate and conditions of New Mexico. Uh, and so what you're doing is you're taking what they call a chemotype, a plant that has a certain type of chemistry and, and now the, the, the legislature has said okay we understand that there's a difference in the chemistry of this plant and that plant. What we look to do in the near future is to begin to breed our own varieties of hemp from Santhica so that you can drive by and you get what they call gross morphological differences. For example, it is theoretically possible you could put a red tinge in the leaves of hemp so that you can drive by and, and the plant would look clearly different. Uh, a Polish uh, land race has bred uh, yellow stems in their hemp because they make paper out of it. And they did it in order to, to pay less for ink because they turn it into yellow paper. So as you drive by these fields, you'll see green leaves but on yellow stalks. So in addition to having different chemistry, you will also have different visual morphological features. So that'll be soon, it'll be easy enough to tell industrial hemp grown in New Mexico. The same way you can look at silage corn that's 16 feet high and distinguish it from sweet corn in your, your grandmother's backyard. But we need time to do this. We need the resources to make this product New Mexico. And I think if we act now, we could do just that. We'll have the few years we need to, to get up and running. And in the meantime, seed production could happen this year. And New Mexico could be leading selling seed to Canada because they don't have enough time in their short day lengths to produce seed the way they really want to. So the seed industry could be an entirely new separate agriculture industry here for New Mexico, and there's three dozen others I could talk about. But I'm glad to be on board, and I'm glad for the work Bernice, Gloria, and Jerry have done. Hello, my name is Jennifer muscat Velarde, and I'm a CEO of Native International Solutions Incorporated. And one of my specialties, um, I really work a lot with community development, um, and one, and NISI, uh, Native International Solutions, is very excited for um, this bill, uh, mainly due to the aspect of community development. As we've heard from the scientific, um, the aspect of THC um, being present in uh, this industrial hemp is, is none at all. Um, but from the more exciting aspect, um, as Representative Begay has touched on, there are many aspects that you can use for the industrial hemp, um, dealing with construction, especially um, nutrition is a very key point, um, and uh, job creation. And it, with dealing with economic development, community development, one of the key things that you look for is infrastructure building, you look for education, um, and you look at health, and you look at job creation. Um, and this is a very key point, um, especially for our state, to get into this early on. 
um, for working with our, our uh, younger generations as well, including those in their 30s um, and 40s, you know, and really be making this become a long tiered uh, industry in New Mexico. Uh, another good point about this industrial hemp is the aspect of nutrition. Um, as many of you know, New Mexicans, we deal with a very high rate of obesity and diabetes. And this is a very key um, plant that we can use to address these issues, even within our schools, um, and bringing in the whole um, aspect, the science of growing, um, and creating more educational fields in that. Most importantly, I think, um, the aspect of biodiesel and um, construction. Uh, when you mix industrial hemp um, with co the concrete that we currently use today, it, pro it can produce a brick up to 30% stronger than the concrete that we use in our regular buildings. Um, that is very, very useful. Um, also, the aspect of biodiesel. You know, I'm sure all of you have been, hitting, been hit by the gas prices. More recently, it's up to almost 350 a barrel. Um, for the aspect of national security, that doesn't leave us in a very good position um, just because we're dependent on people so, so far away. Um, but now with, this, with the passing of this bill, uh, we can begin to pr be producing our own biodiesel right here in New Mexico and um, sending that out. So overall, <coughs> I think it's um, a very important piece of uh, legislation and I think that it'll have extremely good long-term effects for, for our state, um, both New Mexicans and uh, mem members of the native people, the nations and Pueblos. So thank, thank you, you very much. I'd like to commend Gloria again. She was, has been the driving force uh, behind the industrial hemp movement for 15 years. She came to us here at the legislature. I was working on some other things, and she asked for a representative to be gay to help her. And, I, and she also asked me to help her to pass the bill in the other communities that we were able to pass uh, a resolution on industrial hemp. Um, but we, we did research, and when we found out that our elders way back had always been using industrial hemp for their uses where they made clothes, they wove it, they used it for medicine. The, uh, the other things that, uh, that we found was that it was also considered one of the sacred medicines, one of the sacred plants, and this was always, this was always like that. Our elders did it for part of their livelihood. They grew it in the corn. The other thing is that in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo here in New Mexico, which gave us land grants and pueblos and many other tribes their rights, hemp was included as part of the crops that they could still grow. It's been included in the Fort, included in the Fort Laramie th uh, Treaty. It's been, it's been allowed for Native Americans to grow hemp, but then when they created the, the uh, Schedule I uh, condition for industrial hemp, that, that really put down the whole the whole movement of hemp. So now we see that now is the time to do it, like Daniel Minucci said, now's the time to do it. Uh, the economy could use this. I'm a small businessman, we could really use this in our economy. And I see it, I see it, uh, us being the, in the forefront and the spear point of the industrial hemp movement for the future. Thank I'm you. Veronica Tiller and I live in Albuquerque and I'm, I'm also a member of Hickory Apache Nation. One of the things I'm wondering about is that oftentimes a, a bill is passed and but then there's no um, appropriations, you know, behind it for it to go forward. So, has this bill considered that, or is that going to be something they're going to be considering? Because obviously, anytime you start <coughs> a small industry or whatever, there's some need for financial incentives to move the industry forward. As you know, we've, we've done with oil and gas here in New Mexico and the film industry, and just just name any other tourism, whatever. Thank you, thank you for the question. And, and in terms of costs, we did have uh, put in an appropriation of 150,000 towards this initiative. We have taken that out because obviously the 150,000 is, is not uh, defined and our House bill uh, to the budget bill or could, might, could not be defined in, in, the, in the Senate the appropriation bill as well. So what we came up with is it would allow the Department of Agriculture to uh, on a fee schedule that's set at their rate uh, to use that fee to sell and bank seats. And so that revenue will be turned back into, into, the, into their usage for operational costs. The, the, the Department of Agriculture and the New Mexico State University had come back and crafted another language that would be heard in judiciary that would do the same thing as being able to uh, 
invest their monies and time uh, by creating a certain percentage of the profit from the uh, from the seed banks uh, towards the operational and, and the oversight of the industrial seed. So that's that's kind of already been fixated. So the cost will be covered internally through through fees and schedules. I'd like to add that in the very first <coughs> uh, legislation that we did, we did get some funding yes, for New Mexico State to do a study on industrial hemp. So we have gotten funding before from the state for the industrial hemp program. Uh, what I'm foreseeing in this particular initiative in New Mexico is once that the seed banks and once the tribe starts growing and cultivating seeds and, and, and putting these uh, cultivations and, and uh, producing or, or bundling up the, the fiber, and, and taking it to market, I think once that is established, uh, there will be a, a mechanism because now it's being uh, being done on a, uh, just just being experimented upon, and that will be able to create a variety of other mechanism where the, for these individual individual farmers or individual tribes are growing these these plants, will come up with a really creative and constructive ways to bring in the revenues, uh, while at the same time. Uh, being able to uh, ex expand more on the hip, hip farming initiative that will then uh, create that mechanism where other tribes across America can begin to take interest. And I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, dialogues and visitations uh, on these farming sites and the, and the manufacturing thereof. Uh, what I would really uh, anticipate is even tribal um, nations uh, establishing the manufacturing plant to process uh, the, the hemp uh, fiber and, and even producing and contracting with, with private companies and corporations and to they will allow them to bring in more revenues in, into the tribal treasury. And that's what I'm, I'm foreseeing at, at this point. There's a group in Washington DC called the Rural Coalition. It's a, it's a group of small farmers which and minority farmers, which includes uh, Native American farmers, black farmers, and Hispanic farmers, and it even includes the Vietnamese farmers. And they are really, really interested in, in growing industrial hemp for their small farms across the nation. They have many, many uh, members who are Native Americans who are really, very interested in this also. So we're doing an outreach also through the Rural Coalition. And it's working because we have a great feedback coming back from all sectors, from all uh, parts of the nation coming in. I, I heard from somebody this week <clears throat> from the tobacco industry. And they're very interested in this going through because, as we all know, the tobacco industry suffers <coughs> from, I mean, you know, people realize it's not good to smoke a lot, you know, and it's bad for the health. So they've suffered, and they're very interested in replacing the tobacco crop with the hemp crop. Very interested. Well, yeah, that's, it's kind of concerning because I, I think once we get this legislation through, uh, they would then allow uh, the doors to be open for industries to come in. So I'd like to see if the tribal officials and tribal uh, people can begin to, to really get to the forefront. And even some of the small farmers in this, in this region, because uh, what I don't like to see is the corporation takeover. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and having the, the major industry from back east come and take over uh, exactly. New Mexico and then they, they grow and buy lands to grow, uh, you know, the Santica plant and then, and then reap rewards from that. And I'd like to see that this this initiative goes to farmers that are already here, and, and that, that that'd be something that I would be really uh, supporting them. Uh, my name is Jaime Chavez, and uh, I'm uh, actually from Atrisco, New Mexico, so I'm a native of New Mexico. But uh, I also work with Mr. Rudy Arredondo out of uh, Washington D.C. with the Hispanic Farmers and Ranchers uh, nationally, who are also members of the Rural Coalition, as Mr. Fuentes just mentioned. Uh, Representative Begay, to get to the core of the matter, uh, we know that there is a need for regeneration of agriculture in rural areas, uh, particularly for economic development. Small scale, small farms, as you mentioned, uh, native uh, that goes to the, I think, the tribes and to the indigenous people and also to the uh, native New Mexican people that live here in New Mexico. But this is something I think that may be also a wave to the future. Uh, with regard to the uh, the industry is being as clean as it is 
historic as it is as well, uh, to regenerate this type of fiber for textile uh, production and what have you, and all the other uh, uh, ancillary forms of, uh, of, of, of uh, benefit that comes from this in small communities, uh, the type of marketing that it can be uh, impactful on, uh, whether it be through internet uh, uh, marketing or, uh, or, or local markets, farmers markets that are on the increase here to serve uh, 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 New Mexicans and what have you. There's a whole new move and particularly the Rural Coalition and the National uh, Hispanic Farmers uh, uh, Association is, is concerned about the need to have represented representation from small scale uh, 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 beginning farmers, new farmer initiatives. And this is at the core of the USDA, okay, which all, I think, uh, coming from minority communities and what have you, and many times low income communities, uh, rural communities in New Mexico, uh, should be applying for these. Uh, and, and so we need the mechanism. Uh, and, and the means with which to be able to do this uh, through le legislation and, uh, and other uh, support uh, mechanisms that uh, you are uh, working on. <coughs> I just want to basically voice the support of the, uh, of the National Rural Coalition, an alliance of uh, Afro-American, uh, uh, Mexicano, immigrant, and Native American farmers across this country, and also the uh, Hispanic uh, 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 rural uh, farmers uh, uh, alliance as well. Representative, I have a comment. Yes. Um, I, I, I urge you to proceed um, at least with balance when you let New Mexico Department of Agriculture start to be the pipeline. Um, they're going to operate with state efficiency when this is certainly an entre more of an entrepreneurial aspect. So use them, work with that system, but have a have a private sector counterpart because there's a lot of need for nimbleness a lot of need for soaking into the community. A lot of, uh, to, to hit these groups that have been disenfranchised and are way out there, you can't go through the normal pattern. Right. And, and so simply allow for these coalitions, these private sector coalitions, to interact and have some say in the New Mexico Department of Agriculture. <coughs> uh, Representative Gay, I want to uh, acknowledge you for being in the forefront of this of uh, what could be a very important uh, move here in New Mexico in terms of its economy. And I want to give you um, <clears throat> my prayers and thank you for your efforts. But most of all, I hope that this same thing doesn't happen to, to us. Uh, what I mean by that is that, um, you know, Bill Gates, when he first started Microsoft, he started here in New Mexico. He had an office in Albuquerque and the, the, um, the banks wouldn't even give him a loan to start his company, he also saw that he did not have the support, so then he moved to, to Washington State. And once he got there, he got it moving, so I'm hoping that here in New Mexico, we see the potential of it and that we go forward in establishing this as a very important industry because the ramifications are so wide and there are so the depth is just amazing as well for what it can do for the state of New Mexico and you being supporting this, I acknowledge you and I thank you. Yeah, we, don't, we have to be very cautious in, in terms of uh, having a, a protective barriers, you know, for, for the, the, the real intent of this initiative that it go, it's going back to the rural, it's going back to New Mexican. I think that the, the economic engine is, is behind this and, uh, and I, I like to say that as, as we move forward that uh, the stakeholders, but of which our farmers, you know, uh, need to be at the forefront and be part of the, the private industries that we have currently now, the tribe, the, the tribal governments who have a stake in this. Uh, and because I know once it starts to see real money, people will get really antsy. And so we have to protect small farmers and, and at the same time look, looking at ways that this can be very creative, that we don't get this corporate mass takeover our industry here. Um, I'd like to address that specific issue. Um, our corporation um, has um, our whole uh, initiative on forming this uh, Native uh, International Solutions is the idea that, you know, that Indian nations, less developed countries, rural communities, what they do to finance their projects, because there's really not much finance capital in minority communities 
is that they bring in a businessman on a lease agreement. The economic model of development used in New Mexico by Indian tribes and all Indian nations is called the lease operation model. They bring in a lease operator to, to um, take away all of the multiplier effects of the particular business activity. For example, the gaming, most of the gaming is, gaming is actually run by private corporations from Nevada. And the Indian people lease it to an operator who takes a majority of the money that is generated by those businesses and they take a minority interest in that, although it looks like it is in the hands of the Indian people. And rural, com rural communities in New Mexico do the same thing. So what we do as a corporation, a newly formed startup corporation, is we intend to sell advanced purchase contracts so that we can do a backward integration of that money to the local people. If we generate, we do the finance capital development for these uh, less developed countries, Indian nations, tribes, pueblos, and rural communities. If you come to us and do business with us, we will provide you with the finance capital. We call it equity financing as opposed to debt financing from the bank. The banks don't lend money unless you already don't need money. <laughs> that's how it's done. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to do that. We want to keep the interest local with the people of New Mexico. That's the way we're thinking. The second thing I wanted to say is that um, we would like all the citizens of New Mexico to think of themselves as the new entrepreneurs in this development. You don't need permission from a government entity to be a producer of industrial sandwiches. You don't need the permission, you just need the license. And then we work together, we spread some money in the state of New Mexico. People can overcome some of their problems in finance capital in the state of New Mexico. And that's my hope for the state of New Mexico. Thank you, Bernice. And that will conclude our uh, press conference this morning. Thank you for your attendance and your participation in the discussion. Uh, wish me luck as this bill moves forward. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.